Namaste, Tiffany. Welcome to Ahimsa Conversations. Um, and as with everyone else, can I ask you to share what is your earliest memory from childhood of either the experience or the concept of nonviolence? Yeah, thanks, Virginie. Thanks so much for having me. It's really exciting to be here with you. I was thinking about this question, and, and I think the, the memory of becoming aware of what nonviolence or nonviolent action could look like um, came quite early. And I saw some footage uh, on TV when I was very young of the training that the um, uh, people, the student um, SNCC, uh, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee in the US did when they were, they were training as a group to do the lunch counter sit-ins. And it stuck with me very strongly, very significantly about watching the way that they were being trained and the, the strength that it took. I was very young. I was probably younger than 10, I would say eight, nine, 10, somewhere and seeing that very impressionable and, and asking what that was about and asking my parents to explain what was happening. And, and that always really struck, stuck, struck me and kind of funnily and sort of speaking more sort of to the TV culture. I was a child of the seventies, you know, where, where TV became sort of central in the home is that when I was very young, my favorite television show was MASH. And I'm not sure if people know this show. And I, I often credit my desire to work in like the humanitarian world as my very young sort of idea of what that felt like. But what always struck me was it was in a war setting, but the characters, and especially the main characters, were so against war. And it really did a good job of really showing the horrors of war and how they were kind of subversively in their day-to-day -day using humor, using sitcom setup, but subversively trying to do things to make friends with who were supposed to be the enemy, to create conversation. And I think that that really, really like implanted very, very deeply, very young. So Tiffany, where did you go to college? And uh, how did you come to be involved in the unarmed uh, peace work? Because I know that you have been country director of Peace Brigades International. So from college to Peace Brigades, can you share yeah, that part sure. of your journey, please? I was doing my master's study and I was doing a, a, and did a, a degree in my master's degree in human security and peace building. Uh, so it was a new program at the time at Royal, Royal, Royal Roads University in Victoria, my home city in Canada. Um, I, it was just a lovely twist of fate. I wasn't living in my home city anymore at all, but that was the program that I wanted to go and it hadn't been for quite a number of years. Uh, it was the program I really wanted. So it took me back home for a bit. Um, and so it was a new, new program. Uh, and uh, so it had a fairly large scope looking at, you know, sort of the two pieces, human security and peace building. So I started being exposed to a lot of um, uh, sort of nonviolent action, but also what is, what, what was the, the larger world of, of building, of peace building and human security was a newer term at that time. So I did that, I did my field study in Uganda so our cohort traveled to Uganda. We had a partnership with the Makiere University in Canada with their peace and conflict studies. And so our cohort traveled en masse to Uganda and we studied together with the peace and conflict master students there. And then we split up and we went into different parts of Uganda and did field research and, and learned more, had our sort of first real taste of on the ground learning. Uh, and while I was in that process, I was, I was so two, two major things happened. One is I, I was, what I became sort of quite academically obs obsessed with, it was uh, the, what was happening in the internally displaced camps. People were displaced internally in Northern Uganda at that time. And they had moved into those camps. There were large scale camps, 60,000 people, 100,000 people, 30,000 people. Uh, and what we, when we were visiting the camps and what we were hearing reported back was that they had been moved into the camps or chosen to come into the camp seeking safety, seeking security because of the fighting between the army and the Lord's Resistance um, Army, the um, non-state non armed actor group at the time. 
they were and but once they were inside the camp they were expressing all of the sort of deprivation and in some cases abuse that they were they were were suffering there wasn't enough of course of basic needs but also in some cases there was exploitation and abuse at the hands of armed actors both state and non-state while they were in the camp all a long story to say is it took me to start thinking about it just strictly from a numbers game there was what you know 50, 100, maybe 200 soldiers protecting the camps in the area. And there were, you know, all told two, 300,000 displaced persons. And I kept thinking, what would it take if they organized themselves just in the sheer numbers? Like, sure, if you, the weapons are there, but that's just one element. But with, like, it seems to me like there should be a way that they could have a bigger voice, a stronger voice if they organized as a unit. So that was the thing I started thinking about um, for my real, wrote my, uh, one of my final papers on this and I clearly was not mature enough in my thinking yet because the feedback I got back from my professor at that time was, be careful, it sounds like you're encouraging armed insurrection. And which was not at all what I intended. It was completely the opposite. So I wasn't a mature enough thinker yet <laughs> around this topic. And then in, the, in my class, uh, the, uh, the, the, one of the, my, my student colleagues was the outgoing coordinator for the Peace Brigades pro program in Indonesia. And she had been uh, running that program for a number of years, was ready to move on uh, and let me know and suggested that because she'd gotten to know me that she thought I might be a good fit and suggested that I apply. Uh, so I just, I got very, very lucky <laughs> and then was able and to go And did you directly go directly there. to Indonesia? Because I know you were country head Indonesia. Exactly, exactly. So I finished up in Uganda and then went, I mean, besides going home to get orga myself organized a little bit, but then went immediately to, to Indonesia. And in fact, finished write, writing up my, my, my end of my master's work um, while I was already in Indonesia. Okay. Yeah. Um, Tiffany, can you describe... Uh, what is the premise uh, of unarmed peace work? Because as you have yourself written in various places, there is such a wide variety of mm -hmm. uh, peace, uh, uh, unarmed peace forces across the world. Uh, and uh, peace resistors is one. Yeah. Uh, sorry, war resistors. There's war, war resistors, resistors. Yes. yeah. And peace brigades is, of course, perhaps the most famous one. So uh, to what extent are these inspired by Gandhi? What is the kind of historical legacy on which these efforts are drawing? Sure, well, and currently, I, and now I work for Nonviolent Peace Force. So I was Peace Brigades in Indonesia, and now I'm Nonviolent Peace Force. Um, and all do uh, some elements of unarmed civilian protection work as, as we call it, or, or Peace Force work. The roots for, I mean, I, both, both organizations, but I can speak more, more clearly to nonviolent peace forces roots are deeply rooted in the Gandhian idea of the Shanti Sena, sort of organizing as a force for peace. If, if we can organize as a force for war, we can organize as a force for, for peace around the principles of nonviolence. Uh, so that's where the deep roots come from. Uh, and it's the um, sort of real idea that, uh, I mean, in very practical terms, it means we have developed over the years of tools, a methodology, which is tools and actions and strategies that allow us in areas where there are where there is active violent conflict to engage a relationship based approach to working with in a nonpartisan way, sort of sort of creating safe space by utilizing our nonpartisan presence to change the dynamics around how do we manage conflict? How do we, de we deal with our differences? Instead of defaulting to violence, defaulting to uh, more collaborative win-win approaches uh, to, 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 to differences. It's all rooted in the idea that, that conflict, disagreement is absolutely inevitable. Violence does not have to be. Uh, and, you know, it's this really based on this, 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 this inherent in, 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 the, in these magical moments when you are one on one, regardless of what side of an argument you're on, connecting to some people like to use the word divinity, some people are more comfortable with the word humanity in one another, and everything else falls away. And this is when we have our most successful moments, we can be sitting at a table across from the uh, the sort of 
version that the the nickname I always use is as sort of that what the what this person would be would be the genocidal general, somebody who's maybe state or non-state controls a group of armed actors, usually men, and from on paper from the outside seems impossible to deal with. And then you have a moment when you really work on connecting with that person and find some basis of commonality. And often it is, we both want the people in this community to be safe. We just have different ideas about how they, they can get there. And when that happens, there creates an opportunity. It's, it's nothing magical it, 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 in terms of it doesn't suddenly bring peace across the board, but it can shift the dynamics. It can open up space and it can encourage everybody to make different choices. And we do that incrementally, incrementally. Mm. Uh, do you find that this is also able to move long uh, term uh, and somewhat entrenched feelings of hatred and animosity? Mm -hmm. Now, whatever the genesis of that hatred and animosity might be, uh, at the time that you are entering the situation, I'm assuming that it's sort of, you know, solidified and right. it's become such a habit that at one level, because, you know, we are seeing this in everyday life in many mm -hmm. situations. Mm -hmm. um, I think everywhere. That everywhere. Uh, <laughs> everywhere. I mean, very fortunately, in many places, it's not a full blown physical violence, mm -hmm. uh, but hatred as a form of violence. Um, seem sometimes so entrenched and people seem so unable to break the habit. So how do you deal with that? It's a really good question. And it's, I mean, it starts with ourselves. We have to really work on that with ourselves in, in terms of within our own organization. It's one of the challenges we make to each other is we, you know, I have very little patience for infighting. So, I mean, we're in no way saints. We're, you know, regular people who are trying to do this work and are all vulnerable to our own egos and vulnerable to all of our, our own root, roots and, and cultures and perspectives. And we're a super diverse group of people. So we come up together, impassioned working on something and we inevitably have differences. And I have absolutely, like differences again is fine, but when people, refuse to back down and, and, and see the other person's perspective or demand that that person be moved off their team or vice versa. We can't, we don't, we can't have space for that. If we can't do it in our own house, first and foremost, we can't model that and be useful in other places and where people are suffering from much bigger consequences of, of differences than we are in our day-to-day -day work life. So it starts with, with the work that we do from ourselves. And it, and it starts with, I, and the other piece that I think is so important is patience and time, is that there is a, there's this sort of idea that we should be able just to get to peace very quickly and just get over ourselves. And, you know, and we, ch we say people who are living in an in, in protracted conflict, well, if they just got over themselves, it would be fine. Or that original sin, whatever it was, happened a few hundred years ago, time to get over it. But if we do the work on ourselves and we think how we can carry petty grudges around about somebody who maybe said something that maybe offended us and how we will hold that petty grudge, grudge with us, we can be much more empathetic to how something much more profound can stay with you and be entrenched. But it's, it's really sort of willing to dig in. We, our teams work, live and work in the communities that we're trying to support. They're made up of combination, but largely of people from that community. That's really important. And that, that so that it's the centering of the approach of the work is coming from those who are most impacted by violence and that they are centered in everything about the way forward and that time and we the and the way that we know that it is impactful is we hear it from our from our own people saying you know we've got some colleagues who say I used to be the person and one of the people in my community that would be you know saying oh let's go fight let's go deal with this and now I'm the person in my community that people come to to say there's a there's a conflict over here and we don't want there to be violence can you come help and and so that's how the thing we start to see that over time it just becomes entrenched great Tiffany, can you tell us more about how exactly Peace Force works? Because it's quite a feat to have operations across the world mm -hmm. uh, and in so many diverse conflict situations. Uh, that's a management feat. So both, 
yeah both the logistics of it but also right. how do you decide which conflict you can uh, try to help with you sure. know with the non violence peace force yeah thank you no, it's a great question i mean i think so a couple a couple of things of the principles and the way that we w- move forward into new locations is we go on invitation our preferred way to enter into any new place is, is if local people, local civil society knows of NP's work and reaches out to us and asks us to move into their area. That's an initial validation that's really important so that it doesn't feel that it's an international organization that's just sweeping into an area with the answers, but it's but it's actually something that is validated by and, and initiated from local civil society that says, here's what we're trying to do, here's where we think you can help. You know, so we're still in the driver's seat, but you can help. Um, and then, so we'll go in, we'll have a look at what's going on. And then we do sort of a real an assessment. We look at the type of conflict, the sort of what it looks like, what, what the threats are, what, how those threats are, 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 are um, realized, how they're impacting civilians, what's already in place both from the local community or the, all of the stakeholders, the, 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 the impacted stakeholders and any other external actors and where we can fit in. Does our methodology seem like it could be helpful in that environment? Um, and then, then we do some very practical things. You know, can we work there? Can we get visas? Can we, you know, just the very practical logistics? Can we manage the security considerations if it's a very hot conflict, so on and so forth? Um, and then once we decide yes, and then we seek funding for it, uh, and then we can set up teams that, that work in the area. And do you end up working somewhat closely with the UN? Because inevitably, in many of these situations, the UN would already be on the ground. Yeah, yes, yeah. Where there is a UN presence, we we will we work independently, and so we're an independent, non-governmental organization. Um, we will coordinate and collaborate with whoever's working on the ground. So local actors, of course, being the, the first and f- first sort of an ideal partner, local work, other international organizations and the UN. So probably our most noticeable collaboration with UN, actionable UN is in South Sudan because there's such a large UN mission and the role of the, since the war started in 2013, the protection of civilian sites has yeah. really brought us in close contact with working collaboratively with UN colleagues trying to approach violence reduction from our various different directions. Yeah, you, I was reading up some of your uh, articles and I noticed that uh, the uh, the UN peace forces are 13,000 on the ground mm-hmm. in South Sudan. South I'm Sudan, sure yeah. that your team is... Uh, uh, yeah, about 300. Smaller. <laughs> yeah, exactly. but I, in what ways are you, through the non-violence, unarmed intervention, mm-hmm. able to do what even the uh, armed peace force is not able to do? Can you bring that out? Sure, yeah, it's quite different actually. So, I mean, the, when you think about the role of the armed peacekeepers, they are, it's, I, I call it a blunt instrument. It's, a, it's an, a very, an instrument that is used for a very specific purpose. So there is, and largely it is uh, used for broader deterrence. So I, it's more like physical infrastructure and area deterrence. So the peacekeepers will, monitor take care of the UN bases themselves there's post they're posted outside they're there sort of deterring anybody who would who would um, be be attacking the base or, or people that are in or near the base they go for patrols and so on and so forth but it's not that and they're soldiers they're soldiers from different countries trained as soldiers their first line of offense is keep themselves alive keep their colleagues their, their, their fellow soldiers alive and and then it's a very sort of paternalistic, over top of civilian approach, where I am here to save you, stand behind me with my gun, and I will protect you. So it's a very different approach. Our approach is very integrated, embedded, and as I said, centered on the people who are most impacted by violence. We live in those communities. Our teams are comprised of expat staff and people from those communities who speak the language, who are talking to people. We're hearing exactly it, so it's much more it's a more intimate form of protection and it's a more, and violence reduction, and it's a more nuanced approach. So we're really looking at root causes, really trying to help not only in the moment change the dynamics if somebody's at risk, if, if there's fighting, 
one thing that's kind of like the the sort of makes good photo for protection work but the real important work is the deep going down to the root causes and supporting local communities to strengthen their own ability to de-link de um dependency on weapons to de-link the idea that you need an armed actor to be feel safer uh, to reconnect with or re re-strengthen their local ability to have peace infrastructure. And so it's quite different. And we will deal with things like, you know, issues related to children, issues related to women, issues related to violence, all of those, because every, everywhere there's violence, it all adds up to a broader, broader piece of violence, where the peacekeeper's mandate is really about the, what's the formal armed conflict that's happening. Yeah understood and are you finding in many of the situations that uh, today you're the director of the whole organization uh, are, are, do you find on the whole a greater leaning towards nonviolence uh, or is it that nonviolence is a, a craving only when people are fed up of violence you know, Ooh, a kind of a, from violence yeah. fatigue. I know that that's what happened, I think, to a large extent in Colombia, where there was almost yeah. a 50 year civil war. Right. So how much of it is violence fatigue and how much of it is the natural assertion of, uh, you know, saying, look, nonviolence is what we really are. Our species right. essentially is. Which of the two is more evident? Yeah, that is an excellent question. I've never been asked that before. And I think that's a great way to, to, to end in a really important analysis. I think it's, I think we see both. I think in, to be, if I'm really honest, the majority starts at a, at a violence fatigue perspective. And it, and it, and it tends to emerge out of the, we've tried everything else, you know, and, and we're just over it. And I would say that the, the step, is, the next step after that isn't really nonviolence in its true pure sense. It's, unarmed sort of it's it's the putting down the weapons but not necessarily embodying the whole idea of what it means to live nonviolently or live by the principles of nonviolence it's okay we will not use weapons but we might still have systems that feel oppressive there might still be you know those types of things that are still in place without using formally like obvious active violence and then the evolution you know not to say this is everybody in every situation, but I would say majority of. And then you start to have some people who are within that space who are really taking on and embodying a, 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 a broader commitment to, to nonviolence. And then that starts to permeate through, through a community. And you, they start using the language, even if they're not fully living as we all do, <laughs> you know, it, it, not fully living the principles, all of the principles until you start of, you know, say it until it, until it becomes true. You say it, you manifest yourself into that yeah. space. But yeah, no, I think that that's a really important. And we see this now within the UN world, within the humanitarian architecture, sort of all of these humanitarian agencies that are working in conflict zones is that there is a real awareness that the status quo attempt to you know there's 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 violent conflict happening so our default approach to trying to deal with that is send in more armed actors that's always historically what's happened send in armed peacekeepers send in a regional force so on and so forth uh is is not very effective so there's there's yeah. a there's a there's a, a a space a really fertile space right now for 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 doing things a different way yeah and at the same time when you look at something like the South Sudan situation, uh, I, I don't know much about it, but the limited uh, familiarity that I have from a distance, it seems like something that just goes on and on and on. I mean, in one of your articles, you have described it as a Sisyphean challenge. <laughs> so, you know, I, I can see that there is that you must have that feeling of constantly rolling up the rock. So how do you keep up the morale of your teams? And that's one. Uh, and the other is that, uh, of course, this has to be done regardless of whether we succeed today, tomorrow, or you know, next right. uh, ten years later. But do you see some specific ways in which, uh, if A, B, C, D changed, that these kinds of your kind of an initi initiatives could be much more powerful? I mean, so mm -hmm. two questions. One, how do you keep up your morale and what are some of the obstacles which if they were removed 
you right. feel that your kind of work would be far more effective. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, on the morale question, I think one of the most important things is uh, keeping our own egos in check, being really humble about what we, and, and this is a bit inherent in people who are helpers, you know, whether humanitarian or development, but really true in the humanitarian world is it's kind of inbred that you sort of, we will come in and help and we're here and things are gonna be better. And you can tell with somebody who's very new, a younger person in the humanitarian field, because they're really, and then get very upset when there's a point where you look around and you say, it does not matter how much we do, we will never be able to help everybody here. And that, that's true, that's just true. And, and that, can take a real, that can take a real chunk out of morale. And, and that we have to be in a place where we, we are checking our egos, recognizing we're all contributory to a process and we're all contributing to something in, any, in, in the way that we can and that we focus on what's right in front of us. And it is totally valid to be able to make, to, to contribute to helping somebody feel, one person feel safer that day. That's totally valid. Helping one person really think, do I need to be walking around with this weapon in my hand? And if that, you, are, you're able to contribute towards a shift in, in thinking, that is again, part of the incremental change to something bigger and, and more impactful. And, and that, 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 that is just what it is. And ultimately, especially for when we're not from the place, that it's not our decision to make. Yeah. You know, that we yeah. have to, you know, the, the, the dreaded peace colonialism, you know, it's, it's, colon it's colonialism with a nicer face that we're coming in with our ideas of a solution and that we have to sit back. And, and I mean, I think one thing I want to make sure that people really know is that, is that, I mean, we've recently started our programming work in the United States. This is not just something that happens in less developed countries. We could be doing this work in any country in the world, addressing violence and hatred, as you said earlier. It, it, it's manifested more obviously in places where there's open and active conflict, but it's the seeds are, are everywhere and we're all vulnerable for it. Um, and it doesn't matter what our, our, our ethnic, our religious, our socioeconomic backgrounds are, we're all, part of the same picture. Um, and so, you, you know, our teams are really diverse, are intentionally so, people from all over the place. This is, it, you, this is not about bringing in Westerners into underdeveloped countries to save the day. You know, it's really about working together um, and to doing what's right um, and what the people who are most effective. We work in teams, we try and shore each other up. We work really, really closely with our local communities. And that's a lot of the morale boosting that happens there is it's mutually reinforcing. Yes. You know, local communities will say sometimes if nothing else, we just don't feel alone. You know, even if, even if things are still bad, but you're here and you're willing to live in these very simple conditions next to us and we just feel less alone and that makes us already feel better. And that has, that goes a long way for boosting people's morale, you know, and, and from that perspective. Yeah. In terms of obstacles, I mean, I think it, it's getting the systems that are in place, the policy make, you know, those who make policy and from policy comes funding decisions about how, you know, from using very project language or academic terms, we do conflict management, conflict prevention and protection of civilians. And so if we think about those three things from a policy perspective, um, that the obstacles are is the whole global infrastructure is set up around the idea of force or the threat of force is the way that we need is the ultimate weapon that we have it's the ultimate way we it's the ultimate tool and so within the UN within our own to protect the boundaries, you know, armed police to protect communities so on and so forth so the obstacle is really shifting that and producing more research more proof from the field. This is not just a bunch of nice people who run out into, into a, an act of conflict and hope they don't get hurt. I mean, it's very scientific and there is, there's scientific evidence to back and prove why this approach does work. Um, and also we work really carefully what we do a lot of security work, a lot of protection for our, you know, risk reduction work for our own teams to make sure that they can continue to do the, the work that they do. But those are some of the obstacles as sort of breaking down the system of, of, of you know, the, the, the patriarchy system that holds up all of these ideals of force and power. Yeah. Michael Nagler mentioned that there was a Shanti Sena network 
which was mm -hmm. active now during the elections also. Exactly. So since when has uh, Nonviolence Peace Force been active within the US on the ground? Mm -hmm. And uh, can you tell us a bit more about what exactly how the Shanti Sena network uh, was active during this recent election? Sure, yeah. Well, I mean, we've always had a presence in the US um, that's really more about sort of information awareness raising, profile raising. Um, I think you've spoken to David Hartsoe, who's one of the founders yes. of Nonviolent Peace Force. And so some our two main founders are from the US, so we, we, are, we have good roots there. Uh, we, a few years ago, we had a team that went into North Dakota for the, the Dakota Access Pipeline um, work that was happening there. There was, a, there was a call put out from the local community looking for international um, accompaniment. So we were, we thought, oh, this is a, a moment where we could experiment. It was a short-term project just for that period of time. We were it's about six months. And then fast forward to sort of, you were asking about the Shanti Sena Network, uh, some of the work that we've been doing in terms of trying to build the strength of and awareness around unarmed civilian protection or applied nonviolent approaches has been um, about having good practices uh, workshops. So for the last three years, NP, Nonviolent Peace Force, NP has been leading a process where we've been bringing practitioners together in different regions, just just for a few days get together and explore what do we all do even if we don't use the same language to describe what we do but really on the ground what we are doing is very similar and what what makes us different than other ways and how do we how can we learn from each other how can we all improve the practice and how do we encourage other people to do more of this kind of work and that's where the Shanti Sena network really became birthed is when we did this in the U.S. Um, so we had one of these workshops in the U.S. Uh, a year and a half ago, I guess now. And so one of the outputs of that, that workshop where people got together and said the, the groups within the US within, and, and, and Canada and even border and doing border work in Mexico wanted to get together and say, let's, so not, no, not really thinking when that happened that fast forward to the election that there would be a real concrete thing to come around, to come together. Uh, so when, for us, the trigger point was when uh, Mr. Floyd, George Floyd was murdered in Minneapolis. Um, our main office in the US is in the Twin Cities, St. Paul, Minneapolis. And because that's where one of our founders, Mel Duncan is from. And so it all kind of grew up around, around him and the support base when NP was first being founded. So it was literally in our own, our own space, the NP, NP space in the US. So we felt really that we needed to, to do something to help contribute. Uh, so we looked to see how we could help in the local landscape um, in, in the Twin Cities. And at the same time, it was, as we know, it was setting off a, just a chain reaction of protests and activism, which was great, but also a lot of violence that happened at that time and a lot of fear in, in the, so across the US, all the groups that were doing members of Shanti Sena were coming together. There was a lot of coordinating and seeing who could put, who could do offer trainings, online trainings, in-person trainings where it was safe in COVID conditions, and then who could put teams out in the street to do de-escalation work. Um, and so that's how things have really gotten started. And now we're looking to build, there's been such, I mean, we get calls every day asking if we can go to this city, this city, and this city. So there's a real, speaking of a, an appetite and a hunger for a way to do something different. So we're working in, um, with the Minneapolis School District. They were, they, one of the outcomes of, of sort of the, the aftermath of the, of the murder of Mr. Floyd was that the Minneapolis uh, High School District decided that they no longer wanted to partner with the Minneapolis police for security within the schools. But that left them with a, what are we gonna do next? So we've been one of the partners in this process of sort of doing training for their new civilian led security teams uh, to use a UCP approach in schools. Um, as one example, we're working with a union, the, the service workers union that has uh, a, a good chunk of its membership are security guards. And so they see sort of, really interpersonal or sort of stuff that not very high profile kind of incidents of violence or conflict and they're trained to be quite aggressive in their response and they were really hungry to find other tools that they could use that wasn't aggression. Um, so really sort of concrete ways to kind of build into the system within those existing structures an, a, a non-violent approach to, to dealing with conflict. Mm. 
does nonviolence peace force also get involved with the issue of arms control in the us or at the international level the whole question of the armaments industry uh, yeah. which we know there's so much documentation on how it fuels many conflicts globally. exactly so do you yeah. get involved in that at all it hasn't been one of our most significant pieces of advocacy work. It hasn't been a significant piece of advocacy work. I would say peripherally, we follow it. It is something we actually talk about quite a bit is should we be more involved if we are involved on the other side? Where we really focus on arms control is really at the very local level. So in the communities that we work in, so it's not the upstream piece of the the, the production and sales of the arms, but it's the downstream piece of arms are in the community and, and really supporting communities who are uh, looking for a way to, 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 to diminish, if not eliminate the presence of weapons in their communities. Yeah. So we have approaches like setting up how to set up a weapons free zone and all the, the steps you know it takes to get the buy, collective buy-in and the things you need to think about and what are the, what are the ways to enforce in a place where people are used to carrying weapons, you know, carrying their weapons, voluntarily giving them up or temporarily giving them up. So that's more of our focus, where others are more focused on the upstream piece, sort of that higher, higher end of the advocacy piece. Yeah. So Tiffany, in closing, uh, what advice, what tips would you give to ordinary people in any corner of the world who feel drawn to nonviolence, but they wonder and they feel, oh my gosh, how to make it active, how to make it, uh, you know, how to translate it into action, because the climate around us make, makes it look daunting. So it, what it, are some of the small, you know, very ordinary uh, things that anybody could do to reaffirm that value in their own life and, in, you know, in their community around them? Thank you. That's a wonderful question. We often and we get and what I think is undue praise for being courageous and brave and and being being this doing this work out in these areas. And and I think that it's important to remember is that we all make can all make as big of a contribution wherever you are. This is it's not something you don't have to say. I'm leaving my family. I'm going to deploy to another country. You do it in your own home with your own family, with your own self to start with. And the starting place is doing this work on ourselves, recognizing our own reactions, our the violence and the the what could be emerging as hate, even in the way that we speak or think about other people, things we read. We're so polarized these days. You know, when we meet somebody, we're doing a checklist of whether I can have a further conversation with you. And if you if you are not on my checklist, then that's it. I'm no longer willing to have a conversation with you. We're never going to build a more peaceful, just society if we do that. So I think it's the work really starts from within and then your circles within your family, really working with your children, with the people in your family circle to really embrace this, this idea of the way that we engage with each other in your own community. And you can get engaged, you see things, we all see things on a fairly regular basis where somebody is being mistreated in the street, spoken to badly, maybe physically threatened, where you can get involved and you don't need a weapon. There's all of these techniques that are, are, are about de-escalation, distraction. You can use humor, you can use compassion, you can use food, you can use all kinds of things to draw attention away from, 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 a, from an escalating situation. We offer training in this online. Um, so if people wanna learn more concretely what they can do really in their own homes, in their own communities to really be part of a broader nonviolent movement. I would really challenge us all to not be paralyzed by what appears to be the complexity of a situation. The thing that has made me feel, I had this epiphany moment at some point when I was, when I was working in, in various locations around the world is that the, when you down to the granular level, international conflict, the dynamics are the same as if you and I were in conflict. 
we we feel threatened our our personal security feels threatened our sense of entitlement or our place in the world feels threatened i i have this water you're thirsty you know you want this water i mean the dynamics they're just magnified so don't be don't be paralyzed by what you think is complexity and somebody smarter and more powerful than you can deal with it's it's all of us it, we're all just the same. We're all the same people and we can all, we can all engage. So don't be afraid to, to get involved. And to really, the, the last thing I would just like to say is that the choices that we make and what we watch on TV, how we play video games, everything that deifies violence, violence is seductive. It's that, that sense of adventure and power and risk. And, you know, we need to let our imaginations be captured by the potentiality and the power of nonviolence, of what it takes to actually enter a situation that is, is tense and where there's a lot of friction with a peaceful heart and, and to be able to shift, the, shift that away from what could get very, very scary. Thank you so much. You have been so inspiring. Oh, thank you so much. This is my thank favorite you. topic. I thank you for creating space to talk no, about it. Thank you.